I say that shame is is a lost submarine. It is just running the depths. The interesting thing is that most people don't think they have it, and we do. You know, the way that I unearth it, I do it through my money conversations. When I do a money meditation with people and I ask them to think back and I lead them through an exercise, shame, humiliation, guilt, unworthiness, um, but there is just so much shame in different aspects of that people understand like this is way deep down here. Everything that you're working on, if you're doing life, if you're going after uncomfortable things, it just comes up in the present moment. That's why I love being an entrepreneur. Because you want a self-development program where you're going to face all your shit? Start a business. Welcome to the Crown Yourself Podcast, where together we build your empire and transform your subconscious stories about what's possible for your business, body, and life. I'm your host, Kimberly Spencer, founder of crownyourself.com, and I'm a master mindset coach, best-selling author, TEDx speaker, known to my clients as a game changer. Each week, you get the conscious leadership strategies you need to help you reign with courage, clarity, and confidence so that you too can make the income and impact you deserve. Imagine this podcast as your royal invitation to step into your full potential and reign in your divine purpose. Your sovereignty starts here and your reign is now. Neil, welcome to the Crown Yourself podcast. I am just so honored to have you here because I know that you and I share a very similar belief system of a desire to raise our families very consciously and conscientiously to be very intentional with how they are learning. And when did you see the shift that was needed in the education system into more of a world schooling style? Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. I'm really passionate about being a parent. Being a parent wasn't necessarily always in my purvy. I think it's a choice that we need to make. But when you make that choice, you make a choice to really raise yourself to a different level. I often say that my kids raise me more than I raise them. And making that choice to raise me means that I need to also work on my development. So when I think about educating my kids differently, I think about my education as well, because kids own what they're shown. Right? You can't live your life as a martyr, tell your kids, be anything you want to be, sweetie. And then subsequently live a life where you're constantly in depravity, in um, complaining, all those things. So my switch was really sort of a progression of leaving corporate to doing my own dreams to like saying to my family more holistically, hey, how do we all dream bigger? How do we have more ex more experiences rather than more things? Mm. What experiences do you most look forward to? And what are you consciously creating? And what do you define to be a meaningful experience? So, you know, for me, meaningful experience means that I'm present with what I'm experiencing now. I think so many people, when as we get older, we learn to live from the past. And people say, oh, well, time gets faster when you get older. I would say, no, it doesn't. I would say we live more from the past than we live from the present moment. So I define a meaningful experience anytime that I can really be completely in the moment, be in relationship with whatever, whomever or whatever is in front of me, right? And so I've had weekends at home feel like a week and it doesn't have to be abroad, you know? Um, but if we're going to talk about meaningful experiences that are really are travel-based, I would say anything that allows me to bring back something that I previously didn't have. Mm -hmm. Like a lesson, a belief system, a food, a recipe, what have been your favorite things that you have brought back from other cultures? Yeah, so I, you know, we before we jumped on here, we were talking a little bit about shopping. I do enjoy, you know, for a guy, I do enjoy shopping. I always like like looking at like you, styles that are unique or fashion that's unique that we don't have here in the States, you know? Shoes, sneakers are sometimes my favorite to do, but I'll look for anything that like is a pair of pants, a jacket, a shirt that's something that is different. Because I love the ability to like, you know, I do think that how we represent ourselves externally can have a big influence on how we feel about ourselves, right? So it's something that shifts me like that. Um, I would say food is a huge thing. Like 
that's the big thing that I emphasize to my kids too. Is like they don't get to be picky. My kids aren't picky eaters. I'm like, look, you guys are going to travel the world. I'm not going to raise you so that your chicken fingers and mac and cheese everywhere we go. It's like you got to freaking be in the culture, eat the people's food, not just go to the local areas, but often what I'll tell people is like, like, yo, where's the like places that the locals eat, right? Take me there. Take me to that place where, where people eat the local food that, that everybody goes to. Um, yeah, that it, food is so emotional, so cultural. That's a big part of experiencing. My husband has the same desire at any time or anywhere we travel. He's like, I want to eat with the locals. He, like, he, is, he is a diehard foodie and he loves bringing back recipes. And when we went to Italy for our honeymoon, he we stopped on the way back to New York at our friend's house and they had two two twins, five years old. And our friends were like, oh, they won't eat that. Like they, they you know, their traditional American diet. And my husband made this like tomato sauce, like oh, caponata. He made caponata that he found the recipe from when we stayed there in Italy. And the kids ate it up like crazy. And they're like, this is so good. And I think that there is so much value in training a child's taste buds, in allowing them to know that it's not this one thing, but it's that exposure to multiple different avenues. And like, yeah, my kids like hamburgers and French fries, but they also will eat many other things like steak night is my son's favorite thing. <laughs> I'm like, you will fare well when we go to Argentina. <laughs> So being able to open up that cultural palate because it is like tasting the soul of a culture in a way. Yeah, yeah, well said. Now, you're an incredibly successful speaker and coach. When you started your journey, how did you build up that level of confidence to be able to do what you do now? That's a really good question. You know, I don't think there is a... I know that people talk a lot about confidence and getting confidence so forth. I don't think there is one cliff that you jump off of that you somehow parachute into confidence. I really think it's a series of just doing really uncomfortable things and developing the journey along the way. For me, it was like, okay, I was in one job and I was like, I want to be part of sales, but they didn't see me in that role, but I got to be a trader and present in front of investors. And as I got out in front of that, I was like, I want a bigger, different role. So that I took this really amazing business development role that allowed me to travel all over the place, right? And as I traveled all over the place, I was like, wow, I'm not only helping like these multi-million dollar business deals internationally, but I'm ending up coaching a lot of these C-suite people. Because guess what? They have the same problems as anybody else, but in some ways worse because they can't tell anybody about them. And as I was doing that, I saw opportunities to get on stage. I just, it, something just came over me. I'm like, oh, there's a there's a local kind of TED talk that I ended up being a board member of. And they're like, I was like, I want to be a part of that. I saw a video. I saw probably 10 seconds. I'm like, where is it? And I just put my everything into it. I practiced for hundreds of hours. And when I did the audition, they're like, whoa, like you came to play, right? But it's leading forward with that sense of purpose and passion. But if I really think about it, like concretely, if somebody's listening to this, like, how do I do? I've just put myself in, repeatedly put myself in places where I didn't feel like I belonged, only to find out parts of me that were reflected through other people and through other events and circumstances. I think that's such a testament to the power of, of growth and perception. And so often we can perceive and put people on pedestals like the CEOs of multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar companies and think, oh, they have no problems. Look at how much money they have or whatever story we want to correlate to that. They must not have problems. No, their problems are probably bigger and far more expensive problems that you would shudder at if you ex truly were in their shoes. And the ability to just look at the perception and navigate being in those rooms, what did you say to yourself? How did you approach that space of, in a way, being a beginner and still being an expert in your craft? I really think that vulnerability is a permission slip. It really is. You know, there, there's the hairdresser effect, right? Or the trainer effect, you know, people in those positions say that everybody tells them everything, right? They just, they, 
let all their secrets go. And I, I do believe in those instances, even if you feel like, well, maybe I don't measure up or I don't, I, I can't play here. One of the things that you can do is be the person who leads with a little bit of vulnerability. And I'm not asking people to air all their dirty laundry, but it came simply by saying, you know what? I have kids at home, or this is this is the vacation that I took. Um, it's engaging people in a emotional construct, right? That enrolls them. Too many people when they're doing business, they're playing the sales game instead of playing the enrollment game. And what I would do is I would find out little things, ask questions, and then just keep enrolling people in a vision of our friendship, of an, in, a, in a version of their own life, and leading with that. I think the other thing is is that is really valuable is that anybody can add value to anybody else's life. But you have to be targeted in how you add that value, right? And just asking people simple questions that you may or may not have influence over, but you're like, look, you know, how can I help you in this area? Is there some way that I can add value? You know, even if this is not even if this is not my job, is some way I can take stress off your plate? Just showing up more human, but also I think too often in those kinds of conversations, people are like, well, if I'm going to be play equal, I've somehow got to be the same as that. They're not looking for that. They're looking for somebody who can add value at their life at some level. And I guarantee you, it's not that hard of a stretch to figure out how to add value to anybody. Hmm. I co-host these uh, round tables with uh, my friend Megan Contour, who's the CEO of the Dames. And one of the things that we requested the people joining, the women joining, because it's for six, seven, and eight-figure business women, is to make an ask. And what I've seen consistently is that so many women, more so, I, I, I can't say because I, from the men's perspective, but I'd love to hear from from what you see, that they aren't clear on how someone could, else could add value to their life, on how so, they could actually even ask for something that would be in a support space because. Maybe that's their ego getting in the way. Maybe it's you know societal conditioning of like not asking for what you want. But I continuously see with that like yes, I I true I agree with you one hundred percent that there's always a way that you can add value to someone's life. Even um, one of my clients years ago when I was teaching Pilates said that sometimes even just a smile, like just just smiling and being a kind person can add value to someone's life. But when it comes down to making those requests or you know making those offers to add value what have you seen hold people back from really being able to share where they're needing a little bit of support yeah this is such a great question um we didn't talk about this, this is a perfect segue for something that i talk about a lot i one of the things i work with people a lot is their hands are full of a past so that they can't receive anything new people fundamentally need an identity shift that's something that i go really deep with people on but that's where we're that's where we're all sitting and that's not the case when we're children when we're children we we naturally want and ask and receive a tremendous amount of help a tremendous amount of of you know we we lean into our our needs and our desires but as adults we lean out of that and i i fundamentally believe that we're so out of the practice of having somebody help us because we have this lone wolf syndrome in our society where we just say We've got to do it all on our own. So when you when you help somebody, you've got to use way more of your intuition to just offer up something. If you just say to somebody, how can I help you? Most people are going to say, I'm good. But it has to be something very closed-ended that says, that says to the person, would it be valuable if I did X, Y, or Z? Can I come over? It's almost, you have to think about people almost like when somebody's sick and they're in bed, right? You can't say to them, if somebody's really feeling ill, hey, do you need anything? They're just going to say, no, leave me alone. Those people in those areas are that same sort of thing. It almost has to be to the level of, look, you know, I'm going to come to your office. I'm going to pick you up. I'm taking you out for lunch. You know, I'm going to, whatever you want to do, it's it's more of a, we're too nice in the society, right? The other thing I'd like to dog pile onto this is a simple experiment that anybody can do if they're listening to understand the problem with receiving. Try to give somebody a compliment. Do this for two weeks and go around and give adults a compliment. You'll find that I call it the shun approach. It's S-H-U-N. It's rejection, deflection, and qualification, right? It's like, oh, wow, that 
that's an amazing top you have on. Oh, you know, it's been sitting in my closet. I thought I should wear it sometime, right? And I'm like, really? So we have to understand that how we do anything is how we do everything. And if somebody can't just take a simple compliment, what do you think the chances are that when you offer somebody to help somebody that they're going to take you up on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So often, especially for women, I have seen, and this was I, this took me years of deprogramming to just be able to learn how to receive and just say thank you and say thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for noticing versus the deflection or the because I think a lot of people in society we just get validation from being in co-misery so we commiserate together <laughs> and it's like oh yeah but I still need to lose five pounds or oh and then so then you get validation um I call them the three Trojan horses of uh, that really prevent us from growth which is safety or familiarity control and then that co-misery where we get to get validation for some being where we're at and so that struggle to receive like i love the experiment of going around and giving people compliments and then also because perception is projection being able to feel like how do you feel when they do that like do you just lean in and hold space or do you kind of give in to their acquiescence of you know deflection or rejection of whatever it is that you complimented them on Perception is is yeah that's is projection that's really good you know that that delves into something that I also find whole personally close to this whole idea of so sort of the neuroscience and the neuro spiritual that I work with people on right and what I find is is that most people think about their mind if we think if we tell people you know where is your mind people will point to their head but if you're not dealing with a mind that's below the neck you're missing on eighty percent of your mindset you're missing on eighty percent of your potential. And still to this day, when I tell people that, people shake their heads, knowing better and doing better are two different things. But you have to think, by the time we're 30 years old, 95% of how we're going to react react is a pre-program. And most of that is I feel something and I, my brain senses something and as a result of that. And that comes from your mind. Emotions are what happens 90 seconds after hormones are released. Emotions are the stories of those feelings over time. And those are we feel, we feel, we experience with our body, right? We mm -hmm. think with our brain, but we experience with our body. And if you're not tapping into that portion of your mindset for you as a leader, and when you do business, you're missing out on a huge potential of your success and fulfillment in life. Mm, so true. Yes, the body gives so many signals and is so much wiser. In fact, um, the gut sends 80%, which I'm I, as soon as you said 80%, you're missing out on 80% of your body. I was like, the gut actually sends 80% more signals to the brain than it, the brain does to the gut in the vagal nerve, nervous system from your gut. So being able to trust your gut, which many people consider intuition, how do we discover and unlock those natural intuitive gifts that we already have? I love this question. So, um, you know, in my own framework, what I talk to people a lot about is like, I have it, I had this download one day about wealth consciousness, I had it, set it up like the 12 chakras of the body. And at the bottom tier at a root chakra is fear, scarcity, struggle. And we get to hustle and we call that, Kimberly, we call that successful. And I call bullshit. I hope it's okay to cuss on your show. But I call bullshit because that's not successful. Beyond that, then we should elevate to um, alignment. Alignment gets us into action. And as those two play with each other, we then bump up into intuition, which elevates to us to authenticity, which by the Spain study of 25,000 people is the highest vibration a human being has. And that elevates us into wealth. Um, but mo what most people feel as intuition is just a rote response of a lot of fight or flight, which we're in a lot, but you have to play in alignment and action. And intuition, I, the best version of I can give you, intuition is like a gentle, uncomfortable nudge. Mm -hmm. It is not a lightning bolt. It is not a, you know, burning bush in front of you. It is in your quiet moment when your body is still and calm. It's like, oh, okay. It's very divine feminine, that, that intuition. In fact, that portion of the brain that's responsible for intuition is much larger in females. Go figure. 
<laughs> for you women listening, you are much better at sales than men because you can use your intuition more and your sense of emotions. In fact, I was at a Gary Vee conference. He said it. He said, he said it. Science will show. Gut is the first brain. And then I saw a panel of five women. They probably had a billion and a half dollars in net worth. And I asked them a question. I said, what can men here learn from you women as business, successful business people? And they said that we we learn to feel our emotions. We teach our daughters that. And we have trusted our intuition. Mm, so powerful. And I think I love what you said about how women are better at sales because there was something I was listening to uh, Layla Hormozzi's show mm -hmm. just the other day on my walk. And she said an interesting fact that 68% of people who buy from a space of scarcity or urgency, which is, you know, in the past with sales has been really promoted of like, you got to add urgency to the offer and, you know, you have to make it through here. So, you know, grow, 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 get them grow. Yeah. <laughs> it's the bro marketing <laughs> approach. And yet 68% of people who buy based on scarcity actually reject, uh, resent their decision. They regret it. And I think as women, when we can, and I've, I look back on every single sale I've made um, for a high ticket offer and the ones that allowed for space and the space of trusting that allowing my the the person that I'm in conversation with the prospect as people would say in traditional sales allowing that person to just and trusting that they can understand their own time and yes looking at the objections and yes looking at what's coming from fear and scarcity on their part and yes being able to have that conversation to hold them to that standard as far as like what it is that they say that they want and if you really believe that you can serve them at that level but also then giving them the space to say okay yeah like there are certain scarcity pieces that I don't think it has to be this hard and fast, like scarcity deadline, limited release thing. Because every time I look at past purchases that I've made, I'm like, yeah, I'm part of that 68% that, that like, it's like, oh, I don't really like that as much as I thought I did. I have a rule now that I don't purchase anything after 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> Not a thing. So we know what Kimberly's doing at night. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> that was in the past when I set that rule a few uh, two years ago. After I was like, "Oh, I bought another course on something that I probably already know a, a lot about," and as I was going through the course, I was like, "Yeah, that wasn't intuition talking. That was totally my fear." It, it is fear. I love this topic, and as a love strategist and, and, and coaching people on finding, you know, how to easily and magnetically attract wealthy relationships and have the next level of wealth in their life, one of the things that I love to talk to about people about is um, money EQ, right? Money emotional quotient, right? Because so many people, I don't know why, they separate. How I buy things is separate from how I sell things. I'm like, no, how you buy things is exactly how you sell things. And if you want to get better at selling, look into your buying and understand your buying. And I have a money emotional quotient, but at the bottom of it, it starts as impulse, right? And then there's comparison. And then there's optics, which is about being rich, which is the lowest form of money, right? And we, as we move up, we get into, we switch out of perception into perspective, right? And we, we work our way up to revenue, which is more of a need that's above rich. And then we finally, at the top of that, get to fulfillment, which is wealth or desire. And as you go up this ladder, you increase from instant gratification to what I call extended gratification, right? Yeah. So we're moving up from rich, from rich, which is optics, to need, which is which is more revenue based, um, asset based kinds of purchases, which can be even a logo or office or team member, into really wealth, which is the top tier, which is fulfillment, but that's done from desire. But even this idea of desire is misconstrued, and I talk about the desire needs to have four elements. It needs to have earth grounded, air, spiritual or elevated, right? It needs to have a water component, which is sensor, sensory or somatic. And it needs to have a fire component, which is transformation or passion. And for a desire to be valid, right, which is different than a want, it needs at least three of those. And just like you said, you know, I have these Beats headphones here on my desk and I've bought them because you know what? I love how crispy white they are. I love the sponginess of this. And I honestly just keep it out here because 
I don't even use these that much, but I love how they look and feel. And I like looking at them. That's extended gratification. So it's not, and I want to be really careful with this. It's not what you're buying. It's how you're buying it. I never put it like, you want the diamond earrings? Buy them. But know how you're buying them. And if you curate your buying process, your sales process will go much different. Mm. I absolutely love and agree with that. And I'm literally thinking because I it's so time appropriate because I just came back from shopping with my mom for a dress. And I was looking at a dress and I while I was had the mission for the dress and realized that you know certain sizes weren't fitting me and I had to surrender you know the form in which I thought oh this is that's an old form of who I have been and I'm going to embrace this new form blended the perfect one and it was amazing but I found this coat and I've wanted this like type of coat and I it, it's so flappy and I was like oh and it matched my shirt that I'm already wearing and it just it felt so good and I've had this coat on my vision board for the past like while or not on my vision board but on my Pinterest board and I saw it and I was like that's a desire and it's just it's like a badass amazing coat that is very me and my mom goes oh don't get something else that's fluffy and I was like oh this is so this is it felt like such an authentic expression and intuitively I'm like it's summer in Texas I don't need a a coat like this but I looked at future casting of like oh I'm going to be traveling to New York and uh October and Denver and to some colder places later on this year and I'm really looking forward to feeling really fabulous and amazing in this really beautiful warm coat and as you said, those four principles, I'm like, yeah, it hit all of those that had the fire. It had the grounding effect of like, like I felt it in my body of just everything, mm -hmm. my sacral chakra up lit up. And I was like, this is an expression of like full authentic self-expression that in the past I may have said, oh, that's a little too much. Like it's, it's, it's a big, it's a really fluffy, like bright coat. <laughs> but I'm like, no, I'm, I'm embracing that. And I think that that's something that, you know, there's, there's a part of being a good steward with your money and there's also looking at um like i was sharing with my mom one of the stories that, that barbara corcoran has said about how the first purchase that she bought with her first paycheck in sales was like a chanel jacket and she said the way that jacket just allowed her to feel and embody at a new level it changed how she showed up in every area of her life and so there is this concept in manifestation of acting as if and I think a lot of people misconstrue it. I know I have in the past. And it's the acting as if of like, oh, if you are expecting to be a millionaire, multimillionaire, you should go buy the jacket, buy the things. And is that all ultimately always true? Because so often then what I see people do is they end up buying from impulse versus that intu intuition of like, yes, this is the one piece that you can go get. You don't have to go on a shopping spree of like a bajillion dollars that you don't have and put it all on a credit card that you then put yourself into a place of constraint and like, oh my God, I have to make sales in my business. So how do we discern how to act as if in the space of that that's not impulsive? Is yeah. it the, the body? Yeah. Uh, you know, in the place that you're talking about where most people buy from is either judgment, they're buying from judgment, right? Or rather comparison, which is judgment. Those are those go hand in hand. Or they're buying mostly through for optics. And optics, what I what I say the optics are and how I differentiated it is optics, marketing works based on optics. You see an ad over and over again. I love people who tell me that they're not influenced by the things they watch or do. Makes me laugh. <laughs> like, <laughs> have you seen an ad? Do you know why people pay half a million dollars for 30 seconds during the Super Bowl? Um, but it, it is something that gets into our head either through marketing or family or a notion that we've had and we can't let it go and we 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 get grow attached to this it is a pattern we don't understand it, it is a mental emotional neurological pattern and we, we keep reinforcing it by how we're thinking obsessing about it and then we get it so that we can think that this makes us something when we get it right it's it's not the same as comparison because we're doing this because, and that's what you see people do. It's like, if I buy these pairs of, of Jordans, if I have this watch, then I'll be. 
the thing is, is that our goals are backwards because we buy things and then we say we buy X so that we can feel Y. Should never be chasing goals. Should, should always be chasing feelings and experience. So when you buy for experiences, especially an experience that is not instant, but but is extended, then you're buying in, in a completely different and different vein. And I uh, completely agree with you. There are some things that if you're going to be a realtor, you got to buy a nice car. You can't show up because you're going to show up in, in, with your clients. You can't show up in a jalopy, right? Or something that's a rust bucket. You're not going to say that you have your stuff together. If, if you have a situation where it's like, you know what, um, I, I've got to fit in because I'm going to these business networking events and people are dressed up and a suit as an investment, then you, you need that sort of thing. And so understanding that I can, the, the easiest exercise I can give people is when I now shop, like if I'm shopping, not like online, but I'm going to store, like I go to Nordstrom or something like that, I will put everything that I want into a bag or a basket, wherever I'm I will, I will not limit myself on anything. I don't. I push it around. I keep it with me. Um, I completely own it in, internally. I mean, I own it. I own it, own it. I look at it and then I'll, I'll walk around with a complete sense of ownership. And then once I'm done, I'll take a look at those things. And I'll tell you, I end up putting back most of the time, 99%, sometimes a hundred percent, because I have had just the experience of owning it long enough that it, it got past that need of like, it was impulse right? Or it was a low level want, but it really wasn't a desire. And so allow yourself to own it. Like I, I, yes, I could avoid right now. I could invest in some kind of exotic car that I want. I went and test drove those and you know what? I loved it. And I, I let yourself feel the desires, go out and shop for it because part of owning something is the before the during and the after. And if it's only going to be, if it's only going to be during then it's too short lived. And that's where most people, when they shop, shop for. Mm, I, I love that, the difference, because with the amount of consumerism that we have, especially in this country, and like we're so conditioned to consume, and it's so easy to want what we want and get what we want immediately with the press of a button, and suddenly an Amazon truck shows up the next day or in like four hours at your door. And it's so easy that sometimes we lose a reverence for ownership and for the speed in which we can receive. Do you think that our struggle with receivership is in any way correlated to this ability to now receive at the speed of light? Pretty much. Hmm. I would say that it is taken away from the experience of receiving in a way that it does not work for us well. Yes, it makes us want more and more quickly, but that kind of receivership is like cheap dopamine. It is, it is, it is, it is a kind of hit, uh, an addictive, drug-addled kind of hit that takes away from the long-term enjoyment of many other things that we have. I, I, I mean. I, we, I'm like anybody else. I shop on Amazon. We get so many things there. I'll order something at 10 a.m. and Kimberly at 2:30 in the fucking 2:30 uh, in the fucking afternoon. That thing shows up on my doorstep. I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, seriously, this is insane. And yes, it feels advantageous, but I'm not talking about delaying the gratification. I want to amend that. You've heard me say this. I'm talking about extending the gratification, right? Mm. And this, this is the way in which. I see this as all of our 3D behaviors are a mirror for the 5D behaviors. You want to have more enjoyment in your life? You have to hold on to those moments in your life, like hearing a beautiful note on a saxophone. You want Everybody's listening to a song and there's that part where you just love the octave changes or something that beat changes and you can just listen to that part, wait, that part over and over. Enjoying that for longer and deeper has tremendous benefits on our life expectancy, on our emotional welfare, on our overall enjoyment life. If you, Tom Bill, you sat kneecap to kneecap for me. And he said, if you don't live life from fulfillment, you will implode. Life is a game of neuroscience. And after I got my 400 million, all of my problems were still there. And that's why people implode when they get rich. Money isn't the issue. The issue is they're not playing the long game of actually living their life. 
What does fulfillment mean to you now? I would say fulfillment is fundamentally um, living a life of no regrets and living a life from from deeply set on creating unique and relationship experiences. Like I am most fulfilled when I am sitting and creating impact with other people. When I am talking about desires, when I'm helping people let let things go, when I'm creating an opportunity to have something more that was pr previously perceived. And I've done it with a barista and line for a coffee shop. I've done it in a boardroom. I have cried with people on airplanes. I have been invited back to people's houses after talking to them in the city I was traveling in because they said, I want you to come tell my kid what you told me. I have ridden around in a taxi cab for two hours with a guy from Kenya who was seven foot tall. After working on his life, he picked me up like a rag doll or hugged me and said, thank you. And I left with my fist in the air. I had just closed who knows how many hundred thousand dollars of business. That that moment there was the most important moment in my day. Not the damn sale. Yeah, you're just making me reflect on just this past yesterday was a huge day for us and my, and my companies. And like, I was super excited with just the level of conversation that we had. Like there was a moment that I had my son, one of my sons lying on my shoulder, and then the other one was just laughing hysterically. And it was, I was like, that moment, like that. It, I'm just being able to be fully present and feel aligned with business and life because I don't believe, they don't believe in balance. I think they all they all harmoniously interplay together, especially when you have two youngins. Like they they all harmoniously, but most people get out of into disharmony. I've seen when they are trying to put keep everything in these boxes rather than allowing for that openness of caring. And I'm curious because in life as humans people get hurt and sometimes they wall up their heart. Has that ever happened to you? Because you have such a deep level of care for humanity and for humans and like the experiences. And how did you start breaking the cracks of that wall and cracking through so that you can live open heartedly with the level of care that you have today? I want to first just touch on briefly, you talked about balance. And that's such, I think, I, I, I hope that if somebody's watching, listening or watching that, they hear this, and I'll just tell you my version of balance is very succinct. First of all, there is none. That's absolutely, again, a farce. Secondly, your goal, if you can think about a pendulum, it just doesn't swing back or forth. It swings in every direction. It swings completely upside down and swings in every direction. Your goal as a human being is to be able to let it swing to whatever degree you need to be that version of you and to experience all of it. It's deep sadness, it's deep grief, it's total father, it's business person, it's erotic partner, it's whatever you need it to be. That is balance, being able, and most people's pendulum only swings in a few directions. Mm. But when you talked about, you are trying to get me cry on this podcast. <laughs> when you talked about walling up your heart, um, what I would say is that universally, this is the longest road that we have to travel. We are born in an energetic center where we start out in make-believe and should become belief maker. But as adults, things happen, we try to unfill the bad and we end up unfilling everything. And we adopt human operating system 2.0, which says shit happens and you die. And that's a really, really unfortunate place to live that I would say the vast majority of us are there most of the time. Being able to get into your heart center is the most biggest complaint. Now, people might not say it like that if you're not like some weirdo like Kimberly and I, where we do all this spiritual work and we try to get in the heart center and we go to Joseph Spenza, all these places, then you're probably not seeing that per se. But even in those places, people are like, I don't know how to get into my heart center. And being walled off, allowing yourself to keep walled off from the things because you're trying to protect yourself. So let me just give you a reframe. Beliefs aren't limiting, they're protecting. And you can start to get into your heart center once you start to develop a different relationship because these beliefs, what has happened is that maybe you had a mother that was unavailable. 
and you said, you know what? It's better not to need a mother figure. It's better not to receive love because you get hurt. And that belief is there to, to protect you, not limit you. So now what you do is you treat these beliefs as your children and you do a process of inquiry. You say, why are you here? What are you protecting me from? What do you want me to know? And then you honor it. You say, thank you. Thank you. You have worked so hard, man. You are doing such an incredible job. I see that you've done your, you've done the work to try to protect me because these are little parts. These are little Kimberly's. These are little meals. They're mental, emotional constructs. And then you be the main adult personality. You develop yourself and you take their hand and go, you know what? Baby boy, baby girl. I know, I know being loved by other people is hard, but guess what? I'm going to take your hand. I have left you. That's why you keep coming back. That's what happens as we numb out on foreign or lying or all those things. We disembody. We need to be embodied or in the body. You take that little per person's hand and you say, we're going to jump off this cliff and be loved anyways. I know that you keep coming back because you because I keep leaving you. I am not going to leave you again. And you do that process until you integrate that limiting, that protecting belief under you as the adult in the relationship. You need to be the the parent that you always needed. That is our main journey on this rock. Mm. I think back to um, my bulimia days when I reprogrammed before I knew anything about how to reprogram the mind. And I just, I just based everything off of feeling and kind of feeling into how I reprogram my mindset in two years after an eight year battle with no psychological or medical intervention from a deadly disorder. And it was a disorder and anger with my body. And it was exactly that every time. And every time I think of like all the training and all the, the, the learning, I'm like, oh, there was a process to it. But I already knew intuitively like how to do that because it and it comes from love. You can't change from that space of like fighting the limiting belief. And when I look back on how I sped up that healing to be so fast, I stopped punishing myself further for a purge or an experience that, you know, in, indulging in chocolate or whatever. And I stopped punishing myself and I started asking the questions. And I think it really just comes with being curious. And I've seen that strategy play out into parenting where being able to just sit with an emotionally fraught child because the pen dropped on the floor and oh my gosh that's like the worst thing that happened in the world and being able to just sit with that and be you know hold space and say I see you I love you it seems like you're really upset and just acknowledging that I think the beliefs that protect us just like our own selves like we every single human desires to be acknowledged so that that also plays into the parts of our us which I, I think your strategy of just being able to acknowledge each piece for being there and for the good that it's done in your life thus far. And when it comes to that integration, what was the toughest one that you had to integrate for yourself? Well, without a doubt, I mean, everybody has this to integrate. It's it's shame. I, I say that shame is, is a lost submarine. It is just running the depths, you know? I do this stuff, you know, I don't, I'm, the work is never done. I have a buddy that is in a unique stage. I've recovered from chronic illness myself, you know, coming from a house that was a, very abusive emotionally and physically. I know how the body keeps score, um, but it is that level of shame. And, and the, the interesting thing is that most people don't think they have it, and we do. You know, the way that I unearth it is, is sort of, um, it's sneaky, but I do it through my money conversations. When I do a money meditation, with people and I ask them to think back I, and I lead them through an exercise, shame, humiliation, guilt, unworthiness. Um, but there is just so much shame in different aspects of that people understand like, whoa, this is, this is way deep down here. And don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not a therapist and I'm also not somebody who is going to sit and unearth. I do want to know maybe some of the more significant things. But I fundamentally believe that everything that you're working on, if you're doing life, if you're going after uncomfortable things, it just comes up in the present moment. That's why I love being an entrepreneur. 
is you want a self-development program where you're going to face all your shit, start a business. <laughs> or have a child. <laughs> yes, both. Both of those are like the biggest self-development program on earth. Yeah, right. you'll be faced with every single thing. And I, I live by a very simple principle that that which is conscious manifests happily and that which is unconscious manifests unhappily. And so anytime something unhappy happens in my business or with my kids or with my life, I look at how did I create these circumstances, taking such radical responsibility, and then be able to see where's the belief that I get to unearth that is protecting me. Wow. Wow. Amazing. I love that. When it comes to shame, because that's the biggest blocker for money, I found the process of unearthing shame. Is it just forgiveness? Is it just that simple? It's never usually one thing. That's why when we go through, you know, shame's cousin is is guilt, right? So guilt is I, I did something bad. Shame is I am bad, right? That's why shame is has bears so much weight on it. It's never just one thing about just forgiveness. I really feel like most of it is getting aware of it and just having the awareness to feel it and allow it just to come up, just acknowledging that it's there. I, you know, anybody who's listening now, think about like when your friends are down in their crap, they don't want you to solve it or fix it or band-aid it or give them a damn book or send them a therapist, whatever else. What do they want? They just want you to freaking be there and hold space and listen. So this work doesn't have to be like complicated. There are many things that you can do that are deeper levels, shame. I've done those with people, especially grief. Grief is another huge, huge, big topic that nobody approaches because a lot of business owners are in grief. They don't know it. I agree with that. A hundred percent having Having been in grief the past, I would say the past year, yeah, I saw that regularly come up. So I, when you say that they don't know it, what are the signs that you know that you see in a business owner that they have grief but it's unacknowledged? I'm stuck. Most people who say I'm stuck are really saying I'm in grief. If they've been stuck a long time, I'm not talking about like you can't figure out your copy for your ad. I'm talking about I felt stuck for a really long time. That's that's code language for there's a level of grief. And and again, another th narrative in our society that we handle so poorly, go to a funeral, see how many people just awkwardly say, sorry for your loss, I'm sorry for your loss, I'm sorry for your loss, right? We don't know what, to, which is code for, I don't know how to handle this, so let me just awkwardly say something and move away. But it is fundamentally having the temperament for the temporary. My kid was young, now he's older. I had at this business opportunity, now I don't. I was once an athlete, now I have to sell insurance, right? It is anything that once was that you're moving into a new version of that. You have to have had some way to let it go. Why did Tom Brady implode at the end there? It wasn't, it wasn't Giselle and all the other things. It was a fact that who the fuck was he going to be if he wasn't playing football and winning another Super Bowl ring? That is, and I don't envy him for that. That is a huge, huge identity streak. You know how you get, you do, you, it's not bro culture. There is, there is a time and a place. Divine masculine is powerful and it should be used, but mm -hmm. just, just, just saying, just do it, just get it done, just freaking cancel it. It doesn't work that way. That kind of stuff isn't working for 99% of people. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. Hustling through it and just, you know, grating your teeth and burying it. Or as my, my husband's father used to say, just rub some dirt in it. It's <laughs> like... That's not, it's not working for humanity. I think we can see that, I think, especially over the past few years, I think there is a collective shadow of grief that is completely unacknowledged in humanity based off of the past few years experience. Wow. That is, that is one that broke the internet today. What you just said. Yeah. I would a thousand percent agree with that. And so, yeah, we're, we're getting deep into one of my, into my life's vision, but it's to decrease violence on earth. It's to decrease the violence within, right? And people are not reacting in traffic and all those things because they're just upset. They have no a way to understand how to grieve through the things they need to grieve through, right? And when we have something like COVID happen and all the anxiety, we need each other. And we're now more disconnected than any time in human history. And every generation says the next generation is going to hell in a handbasket. That's also incorrect. 
but I will say this generation has their unfair share of anxiety and grief like no generation before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you process your own grief? So I had a coaching client who lost six people in five years. And in fact, since she was six years old, she's either had a pet or relative die every year. So she was in a tremendous amount of grief. And this is how I coach. Um, I coach very strategically. I'm an ideator, I'm strategic, but then I'm very individualized in my approach. And on that call, which thankfully I recorded, I wrote her a grief process. I said, here's what I want you to do. And ironically, it was somewhat the process of the protecting beliefs, what was basically writing a letter of tribute to our grief, to, to the thing that we didn't feel, um, creating a shrine, you know, some, some memorabilia, and going through that process multiple times and then releasing it, right? Just physically releasing it. And I'm not detailing it here because it's, it's a little more involved than just doing the process, right? I have to coach people through it. But after she had four or so years of not making anything, we coached for six months and on the ninth month, she made her first 15K. It's not about the money, but she also had things in her body that healed. Now, I'm not a health coach. For the lawyers listening, I'm not saying that I'm doing anything <laughs> helpful here. <laughs> but I do know that our relationship to those kinds of things, speaking from personal experience, there's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of healing that are, can occur, but we have to acknowledge it, release it, pay tribute to it. And yeah, yeah, she's become a lifelong friend because of that. Mm. The work that you do is so powerful. And I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for being such a light in the world, Neil, and just bringing so much hope and also processifying it. <laughs> I appreciate that as the as a Virgo. So <laughs> nice received the grief. I mean, for me, when I experience because I experienced a a lot of grief and transformation and transition within just the span of two years of losing three family members and two family friends in one year. And then moving twice and having a baby and still having a business. And uh, it was it was a big couple of years, let me just say. And I want to say for everyone listening, I did the, Neil's recommendation of writing a tribute. And for me, it wasn't a, the hardest stage of grief to get through was my own anger because it was something that I was constantly shamed for as a child. And that being able to write a tribute to my anger and honoring that anger as a piece of the grieving process, as a part of, you know, that was righteous within me mm. and that allowed for, for, you know, just to give space for that and not judge it for being anything more than what it was, was probably one of the most tremendous healing pieces to my own grief journey last year that I have ever done. And so for those grieving. I hope your listeners are hearing something brilliant that you said there that, that I kind of left out of the process, but I'd like to just revisit is that what I set up for her and what we all need is, is some ritualization. I can't even tell you because of the age of information we have gotten completely away from ritual. And ritual for us as human beings has tremendous spiritual and emotional value. There is nothing greater that you can do in the grief process than develop some kind of ritual that you can revisit to keep experiencing and then keep moving the grief forward. Mm -hmm. I love that you touched on ritual because I think that ritual and reverence are two things that we have significantly lost in, in our culture today. And I completely agree that like I'm currently reading uh, Dangerous Mystic about the life of Meister Eckhart. And, you know, he's describing them. The author is describing the medieval times. And, you know, everyone thought, you know, medieval is horrible. And it actually, you know, people just were still people. They had still had kids. They still, you know, had problems. They still had lives to live. They still felt feelings to so these these perceptions of the some past being either greater or or less than than where we are now it's it's i think that that plays a lot into grief because grief can sometimes in some ways memorialize people in a way that is not actually accurate as to your own experience 
And when my father passed in 2021, that was probably the greatest trend, one of the greatest initiations that I was able to experience of feeling the soul leave and be free. And then also recognizing that the past of who he had been as an addict and as just the struggles that he had had as a human being were gone. And the revisitation to his grave. And I was like, I'm never going to go there again because that space was his humanity. And I felt literally like something was choking me at that space and being able to navigate the dynamics of grief and the different spaces and areas because there's a great um and I, a concept in native american culture that you know when somebody has lost someone the family member that's close to them that they've pierced the veil and they're between they're closer to the spiritual realm than they are the physical realm and so they're in bet- almost in between worlds but not quite and i think we can when we can look at our own past identities in that space as well then that allows us to level up most of success is not acquiring it's letting go so those of you listening that feel like you don't want to touch grief i'm just telling you if you want something new you have to let something die i have had major transformation in life i've fundamentally burned a large part of my personality and things to the ground it is and it is tremendously challenging process to do we knew that we do that why do we do uncomfortable things because it's not that what we're acquiring it's not that at all it's what we're letting go we always think about it oh i've found a new identity well guess what i received that new identity you had to fundamentally let something die and let go and that is grief that is grief the wild edge of sorrow is one of the best books i've ever read on grief anybody wants that is tremendously helpful yeah yeah i'm currently reading um grief by dr john connelly mm-hmm. who's the founder of rapid resolution therapy phenomenal conversations and i and i remember what you're saying of of letting go it really reminds me deeply of from uh from florence scovelshin um and her book the game of life and how to play it and there's a piece of it where she says that you know the more knowledge and i know that everyone listening to a podcast on spirituality business development and growth is like you have have a lot of knowledge but the more knowledge that you have the more you've awakened yourself to that inner knowing and the more you don't take action the more negative karma that creates where you know, when you know what you need to do, but you're not taking action, you're not listening to those intuitive nudges, you're not letting that past version of yourself die. You're not letting that pass. And I don't mean die in the physical sense. Like we're all, like, I just said that we're all clear for the mental health uh, disclaimer. Like, I mean, like letting that self of that ego, the the personality go. If you're still clinging on to those ashes of that past of who you have been, it creates more negative results until the, the the universe basically like that's just what i've experienced in my own life but this that, that letting go process is so essential and the more you know that you need to let go the more you need to let go in order and the faster you will actually quantum leap when you do yeah i couldn't agree more beautifully said beautifully said my friend so neil how do we find you how do we work with you how do we see you rock the stage and you know bring us to tears and Help us let go of of our grief and our shame and level up into a new level of, of wealth and alchemizing this uh, 3D world. Good, great word, alchemizing. Well, you know, I have a wealth matrix. It's wealthmatrix.club. If you'd like to visit that, um, you can find me on pretty much any social at Neil Falora as well. I work with people primarily who want to create impact, but also want next level of wealth, but what they consider wealth as fulfillment, worthiness, success, revenue, relationships, right? And fundamentally helping people create that in the relationships that they have. It can be much easier than you think. So I invite anybody just to reach out to me over DMs or or otherwise, um, and let's have a chat. I don't do anything by scarcity anymore, um, any sort of thing. Um, it's all attraction-based. And I people I work with want to be there as much as I want to be there. I'm not casual about any relationships. I don't know how to be casual about relationships. I'm a very passionate person of all in. So thank you for having me today, friend. This has been 
a great conversation. I have loved and enjoyed every second of it. And as always, my fellow sovereigns, own your throne, mind your business, because your reign is now. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If what you heard resonated with you, be sure to subscribe and start creating a bigger impact now by sharing this with a friend. Just by doing that one simple act of kindness, you are creating a royal ripple to support more people in their sovereignty. And if you're not already following on social media, connect with me everywhere at crownyourself.now for more inspiration. I am so excited to connect with you in the next episode. And in the meantime, go out there and create a body, business, and life that rules. Because today, you crown yourself.